Special thanks to Cars of Somerset for providing the M4 in this review, and of course if you want to check out this car, if it's currently still for sale, or if you're watching the video down the line, perhaps their other stock, or get them to source you a vehicle within the UK, then of course you can find all of those contact details, as well as their current stock list, in the description right below this video, by clicking on the link. <laughs> When it comes to filling the shoes of an outgoing predecessor, you could pretty strongly argue that very few cars have had as big shoes to fill as the M4 did when it replaced the iconic M3. And of course, not too long ago on the channel, in this same series, I reviewed an M3, a lime green wrapped, stripped, caged, lowered, track day focus version of the E92 which is a modern icon already in its own right. Now, how does the M4 compare to that? But also, taking a step back from the M3, how does it stand just on its own two feet as well? Now, incidentally, if you are new to the Beards and Cars series, not only have I already featured that M3, but I've also, perhaps even more interestingly to compare to this car, reviewed an M2 competition, because in particular this is not just a normal M4, as you'll have seen from the title, this is the competition version as well. Now with that being said, most of the things that I'm going to be discussing in this video will apply to a normal M4 as well, or even the convertible version. So first of all, let's talk about the things you need to know. For those who are less familiar with an M4, and are considering it maybe as one of your possible cars to buy, or maybe you're already super into it, or just haven't looked at all the technical specs, what can you actually expect? Well, compared to that previous generation of M3, there are some radical differences. First things first, the car is immediately lighter than the M3 by a good 80 kilos. That's not an insignificant difference. In terms of the engine, it is wildly different, with that previous car being a very nice, barky, naturally aspirated V8, exactly my kind of engine, and similar to the engine in my own car, this one goes down a totally different route of a twin-turbo, three-litre, straight-six, for a number of reasons, and a number of benefits come from that. Now, a couple of the interesting benefits are not so much the raw power and the raw torque, but more the way that it delivers the power and torque. Not just being turbo-aspirated, which of course sounds very nice, but also the rev range that you can achieve them at. And to highlight what I'm saying, a standard M4, the non-competition version, which we'll talk about the spec differences with in just a second, puts out 425 horsepower, which is already, of course, a slight improvement over the M3, around 414, and a whole lot more torque. That is the massive difference between this and that previous generation car. Now, I don't recall exactly what the torque figure on that E92 was, but if I recall correctly, I think it's under 300 pound-feet. This one, on the other hand, 406 pound-feet. That's just below JAG XKR supercharged territory. And of course, the turbo aspiration goes a long way to help with that. But here's the interesting point. That 425 horsepower is available from anywhere between 5500 RPM and 7300 which in other words is where the electronic red line comes into play. Now, you can technically rev it even higher than that, up in the higher 7000 region, but between that limit of 73 and the lower end of 55, that is a broad swath to get peak power within, and you can feel that kind of shove when using the car. The second thing, though, is arguably even more useful, and it relates again to the torque, because the peak torque in this car marries so perfectly in with that power that it is no surprise that this is such a straight-line missile, even given what could easily be considered an understated amount of power by even 2014, 2015, 2016 standards when these first came out, because that 406 pound-feet, which is incidentally 550 newton meters of torque, arrives anywhere between 1850 RPM and 5500. That is a very broad range, even more so than the power. And if you'll recall, I mentioned that that peak power kicks in 
at 5500. So in other words, from 1850 all the way up to 5500, you've got all of that over 400 pound feet of torque shoving you forward, and then as soon as that torque peters out from its peak, the power takes up the slack and takes over. So it's no surprise at all that the sheer straight line performance of this car, especially when coupled with the seven speed dual clutch transmission, means that it can belie its raw spec. Because 425 horsepower isn't bad, but this car does not have all wheel drive to launch it off the line like a beast, and yet, even with rear wheel drive, this 425 horsepower model, in its base form, can already do 0 to 60 in 4.1 seconds. That's borderline supercar territory from just a couple of years ago. Now that in particular is with the seven speed dual clutch, the quote unquote auto, if you will. Once again, it is another example of the auto being quicker because the manual version does not to 60 in 4.3. Now incidentally, the option of having a six speed manual, I actually think is a good thing because even though as many of you know, I personally prefer autos, for a variety of reasons that I went into in its own dedicated video, I love that people actually have the choice. Because just because I don't like it doesn't mean that other people shouldn't have that chance. And traditionally, that's the kind of option which I praise stuff like the Porsche 911 for, for keeping the traditionalists happy, as well as having the newer cutting edge stuff. Once again, Beamer delivers that here as well. Now, interestingly, where the competition changes is mostly in terms of stuff like the suspension differences. It has uprated seats, uh, slightly revised interior, the seat belts, for example, are changed. But it's more so the cornering that's improved on the competition, as you'd expect. With that being said, though, the power is upped slightly as well to 444 horsepower, about the same as what the previous M3 GTS version had. That means that the 0 to 60 drops just a little bit more to 4 seconds dead and 4.2 seconds on the convertible version. And of course, with the standard car as well, the convertible is just a little bit slower, with all of them being technically speed limited to 155 miles an hour flat out. So with that under consideration, with the fact that at least on paper, its performance and the specs and the engine that it's working with are very impressive, and there's a pretty strong argument for saying that it is a more impressive car immediately than the E92 M3 was. What about in actual practice though? Because as any of you who have driven a number of fast cars will know, there's a huge difference between being good on paper and how that actually compares to, for instance, a more raw or old school purity, which something like that M3 may still have an advantage in. Now for me, usually, I would go for the purity, and I did like the E92, spoiler alert if you haven't watched that review yet. However, I actually did find myself liking the M4 more than the M3, and that really surprised me, because typically I am a little bit more of a traditionalist, at least in every way except gearbox, and I do like a car that has a little bit more of a simplified, more characterful approach. Something that's, for example, naturally aspirated, rather than turbo or supercharged, something that's a little bit simpler in its approach to performance, and isn't necessarily trying to be as quick as it could be, because it's more designed to be engaging and fun. The M3 ticks all of those boxes, and if that's purely what you're looking for, then absolutely go for one. You can actually buy a really good condition E92 M3 for a similar kind of price as what you should expect to start paying for something like an M4. However, if you are looking for a quote-unquote better car in an all-round sense, I would fairly strongly argue that the M4 is that. Although a major part of me wants to like the M3 more, as an objective reviewer I have to be honest and say, I found the M4 to be a better car, and this competition version I would say does a very good job, in a similar way to how the M2 did, of being more hardcore and more focused, certainly more track ready if nothing else, but without going too far. This isn't as hardcore as something like that stripped out hardcore M3 was, or even something like the GTS which comes like that from the factory. Speaking of track day toys though, that brings me to a crucial point when it comes to buying an M4. And this is the point of the video where we're gonna get into stuff like what kind of prices you should expect to pay, how much usability you can get out of it if you're gonna use it as a track day car, versus if you're gonna use it as a daily driver, and also potential issues that these cars can have or that you should look out for. Now, first of all, as far as price, they're actually a little bit more reasonable than you might think. 
even for the competition version here in the UK. Now, the competition car runs from about 2017 up to 2020. You can find some 2016s as well, but these are actually, as I said, not as crazy expensive as I would have thought they would be, given the extra rarity and extra performance. A normal M4, in decent condition, you should expect to start entering the market at about £25,000. Well, this competition only adds about 5000 more onto that, at about thirty grand. Now, granted, you can pay up to 60000 for one of these for a later 2020 shape, before the facelift, but even so, that's not quite as crazy as I would have thought it would be. And incidentally, if you do plan to use something like a normal M4 or even this competition version as your daily driver, well, the practicality is definitely there. And that is one significant merit I would give the M4 over something like an M2. To me, the M2 has, as I believe I mentioned in its own review, fantastic proportions. It's very 1M-esque. It's small, it's chunky, it feels burly. It's a little bulldog, and it's all the better for it. It's a lot of fun. It almost has the spirit of a hot hatch, but in a slightly bigger, more coupe sports car-esque frame. The M4, on the other hand, has that advantage, physically speaking, of being bigger. More interior space, more rear space, etc. And even the vehicle itself just has completely different proportions to an M2, which will appeal to a different kind of person. Now, in terms of, for example, using one every day, the rear seats aren't the most spacious around, but they do have enough space if you have kids. The trunk space is pretty good. The ride quality is certainly good enough, even in this form. It's still a far more than comfortable enough car to use every day if you chose to. And even though it doesn't quite meet the average marketed specs of fuel economy, which is about 25 in the city, 42 on the highway or motorway over here in the UK, and an average of 34, in reality, you should expect more the 24 to 26 to the gallon average. And that tracks with what I was getting on the heads-up display in this car. To return to the point of track days though, this is where we're going to talk about the potential issues, because depending on what you plan to use your M4 for, that is going to decide which car you should go for. Now, if you're going to buy, for example, a normal M4 and you want to use it as your daily driver with an element of fun, which is essentially what I do with my cars, then I would actually recommend getting the lowest mileage you can afford. Even if that means adding like five or 10 grand over a baseline price, the difference that's gonna make is notable. And there are two primary reasons. Reason number one is that when I researched most of the issues that can happen to M4s from all models, you know, GTS, competition, normal model, etc., manual, auto, across the board, three out of those four common issues are age-related. Now, one issue is known about this car, but it is very rare. It's like half a percent of drivers, and that is crank hub issues. But again, it's not something the vast majority of people will need to worry about, and it's not an age-related thing anyway, so there's no absolute way of avoiding it. The other three, though, are valve covers, including the gasket, the oil pan gasket, and the oil filter gasket. Those are all age-related things that can sometimes leak in higher mileage cars, which isn't really surprising. So if you do get a lower mileage vehicle, especially one which has had that crucial, I believe it's around 1600 mile or 1200 mile initial break-in service, well, those are gonna be in much better running condition. The second reason though, is track days, because the M4, much like its predecessor, is a hugely popular choice of track car, modified or otherwise, that is, you could say, part of the appeal. The downside to that is it means that a car which has been used as a track day toy, well, chances are it's been pushed to its limits, at least some of the time, and driven very hard. Less forgiving, harder use, it just means that by definition all of the parts on the car are worn at a much faster rate and certain things will categorically be closer to needing replacement or even braking than a car which has been owned by somebody who perhaps used it as a weekend toy or even used it as a daily driver but sparingly without necessarily flooring it everywhere. So if you are going to use it as a daily, absolutely spend a little bit more, get the lower mileage, lowest you can I would say, and look for one that has been taken care of. And stuff like receipts, servicing history, especially on a later model with that lower mileage, 
it's going to be fairly obvious, even just talking to the kind of person who owns the car, not to put too fine a point on it, but you can typically tell sometimes if somebody's the track day type, <laughs> let's say. If you're not as concerned about stuff like that and you do plan to modify or track day the car, well then you could risk going for a lower price, higher mileage model because some of the parts you're doubtless going to swap out anyway and the risk of it wearing quicker is probably not as much of an issue for you. So that's the rough rule of thumb that you should be looking at. I think most people who are looking to buy one probably want to do it as a daily with a smaller percentage of people going for track day use. And I actually find it curious that the M4 is so popular as a track day toy, not because it, it isn't good for it, of course it's exceedingly quick and very capable, but there are two things which surprise me about that. One is it's a little bit too forgiving in terms of being a pure, raw, old school track day toy, and secondly, most track day aficionados seem to prefer a more raw experience. Manual box, old school driving style, maybe even something like a naturally aspirated engine. In which case, why wouldn't you just get an M3 and save a ton of money and then modify it and use that as a track day toy, such as the green one which I reviewed? That to me just seems like more of an obvious choice and a better suited one. But hey, maybe that's just me. So as I always like to say in these reviews, if you are a current owner of an M4 in any form, then of course slap your thoughts down below, maybe some cautions that you would encourage people to think of, or things that they should check for when trying to buy one or test drive one. Or if you used to be an owner, share your stories as well. If you are a fan of the car, if you're looking to buy one, or even if you just watch the channel and are a fan of these reviews, then drop your thoughts down there as well on the M4, competition or otherwise. And of course, be sure to stick around for more car reviews and check out the M3, M2, etc. that I've already talked about. But until next time, I'll see you then, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.